Hello, I want to welcome you to Lighthouse Fellowship Church. And we had a wedding yesterday, so those of you that want to follow, find it on a live stream, it is it is on live stream, Facebook, on my page, so just go into uh, Tony Richmond Salina, and you'll pull me up, and it'll be on my page, that's how we've been doing it. We'll eventually get everything to the church page probably, but, but right now it seems like it's where most people find it because I've got so many friends, and so... Uh, Something like 3,000, 3,200, or something like that. Do I know them all? Maybe not. But anyway, uh, it's fun to have good people to communicate with, and thank you for those of you that do. Lighthouse Fellowship Church, we welcome you. Live stream, we welcome you here. Thank you for coming. And again, my son was married yesterday, had a wonderful time, had a pretty nice wedding, and had a really nice reception too. So, those of you that want to go online and find that on my page, go right ahead and do that. Uh, it was, uh, James videotaped it, and uh, we are, are glad that he was able to do that. And it, we had permission by the bride and groom, uh, and also everybody, that we could just go ahead and do that, post it on Facebook. Uh, uh, we want to have you pray for Jess King's family. <sighs> Jess King passed away this past week, and uh, we will miss him terribly. Had a surgery uh, for some ulcers, and there was bleeding, had two ulcers that were bleeding. They started bleeding profusely. Uh, they got him to the hospital, they were gonna do, and they did surgery, but they couldn't find the bleeding where it was coming from in enough time to save him. And so, and they did try resuscitation, they did try uh, to, to, to do the, uh, all that they could to keep him alive, but it just did not work. So listen, I just want to say it this way. There's a time appointed unto man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. It's an, it's an appointment that God keeps, whether it's birth or whether it's death. There is a time that you and I will go on into eternity, and hopefully you and I will be ready. I'm ready. I, you know, I, Carlina and I talked about it. It doesn't matter when God takes us. You know, we're going to be ready, and we're going to a better place. Just like uh, Jess is over there. He's probably getting a band together right now. I'm not sure, but uh, he does real well with the music, and we're going to miss him so much. He's my music buddy, and uh, just, you know, one of them, but he's been a great influence on me and uh, with music, and, and I really appreciate it. And, and so, and I just want to say to the family, we feel the grief as a church, and the members here, and we will be praying for you and your grief. And I'll announce this right now, since the family has given me permission to do that, we had to wait till after this Saturday so there would be no confusion about when, what Saturday we're talking about. We're talking about this coming Saturday, November the 6th, will be the viewing, one o'clock to four o'clock, and then the actual memorial service will be four o'clock. And so there will be, uh, for the family, there will be a meal that follows. And so if you can, some of you that know that how the meals go and so on, if you could come and help, Marsh uh, and Steve, uh, if you could come, and of course, Carlene and myself, we'll be there, Terry. Uh, we may need some help here with this. And so if you can think about how that you can come and help. Um, and the catering, uh, I'm gonna, I've, I've asked KFC to cater it for us, and so they're going to get enough chicken for the family and, and possibly for a couple pieces of meat each and then the sides. But if you can bring some sides and some desserts, feel free to do that, okay? Because from what I understand and from what I know of, the, of Jesse's family, Jess King's family, it's big. When they have reunions, they have reunions, you know, when they get together, they get together. And so, uh, and we, we really uh, would uh, like to encourage the family to be here. And, uh, and of course, I know they will. They love Jess that much. And, and so, uh, just want you to know that this has happened. Very unexpected. But God didn't say we would, uh, well, we would expect that time when he takes us. Okay, so, just want to let you know that. And uh, do we have any announcements, Terry? Did, did you want to come and share a couple? I think we've got a couple of singings coming up. Terry Brandon, associate pastor here, 
We also have Richard Robbins. He's, he's working every other weekend, I believe, and uh, when they need him to also. So he's kind of on call many times. So uh, Richard Robbins, our other associate pastor. And here's Terry Brandon, our associate pastor. God bless you, Terry. God bless you, and I think there's a couple of things he needs to tell us about. Well, good morning, folks. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Surprisingly, this time of the year, there's a lot of holidays coming up, so uh, there are also a lot of activities. But one that's pretty regular is Wednesday nights here at the Fellowship Hall at 615. We do have the Bible study. It's on 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we spent a lot of time on that, and we got through the first six verses. So that was okay because we got in there pretty deep. There was a lot of conversation and discussion, and that's pretty important when you get into a Bible study. You, know, you really want to ask those questions. You really want to investigate and learn so much with that. So again, we're going to be on 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, working on that. It's going to be another exciting time there. Another thing to remember is if you wake up Sunday morning, you're going to get here an hour early if you don't change your time. So, yes, November 7th, that Sunday, is Daylight Savings Time. So make sure you set back your hours in there. You get a little extra sleep. Don't take advantage and sleep over. Uh, again, set your back, your clocks back an hour before that day. But we lose an hour, is that right, Terry? Yes. It falls back. Well, I don't say we lose an hour. I say we get a little extra hour of sleep. Fall back, so spring forward. We fall back. Fall back. So fall back, yeah, you need that extra hour of sleep. Okay, so, yeah, okay, that's right. Okay. I always get it. Uh, <laughs> spring so, forward, fall back. So, forward. yeah, that's great. <laughs> so, uh, so we get to sleep in an hour. Yes. Or you can take that extra time to read the Bible. There you go. We can make that pretty productive around here, can't we? That'd be good. There's got to be something there about the daylight in the Bible somewhere, so you may read that up, and that might be a good message on the daylight. Well, there was a time when, you know, God actually caused the sun to stand still. And, uh, look that up. Find out where that is. Report back in a week. <laughs> a little homework there. And then also, um, we have the Southern Air is coming. Uh, do we have an exact date? On we that? don't have a date yet, but it's in November and it's a Christmas concert. So November it will be a Christmas concert, so it's got to be somewhere around Thanksgiving because that's right there at the end of that week there. And then also there will be a carrying dinner after that as well. So um, lots of meals coming up here for the month of November. If you find one that goes really well over uh, uh, the funeral next week, then bring that in again and We'll just have double the blessing on it, so that'll be good there. But uh, yeah, so the Southern Airs will be here near the end of November. Uh, we'll announce that date. There'll be a carry-in dinner with that. And then also, I know there's one other thing. There's a, another group that's singing, but they're going to be coming um, that's gonna be in July. next year in, in July. July. Yeah. Calvary's Love. Calvary's Love. Calvary's Love. Calvary's Love. It's going to be in July. I okay. don't I don't know if they gave me a date or not. I have to go back and look, but it is in July of 2022. Plenty of time to post it. Yeah. All right, it'll be one of those sunny Sundays, so in July, so we can look forward to that as we enjoy the winter weather coming our way. Okay, are there any other messages we need to announce? I think we've pretty well covered it. Okay, we'll bring the pastor forward and we'll get on with our worship service today. Thank you, Terry. God bless you. God bless Terry's you. been doing a great job helping me on Bible study on Wednesday nights. We've been having a good Bible study Wednesdays. And uh, if you will, come on and enjoy it with us. And um, I can't remember. What did we say we're having Wednesday night, Carlene? Do you remember? Okay. I think it's lasagna. Lasagna from Ruler. It's triple, triple meat. And so I know it takes a little while to, to fix it. Uh, but we may have to fix it here in this oven. Ours is, our oven is kind of acting out a little bit, so, but we'll see. But uh, we will, it's either going to be a pizza party or lasagna. We'll let you know. Okay? And I'll take a survey after church and find out what wins. <laughs> All right. Pizza and pop or lasagna, pop, and desserts, either way. All right, so as we look at Ephesians, we're going to talk today about... Growing in Christian maturity. 
growing in Christian maturity. So as we look at this, it's going to be chapter 4 of Ephesians. And as you find that, Ephesians chapter 4, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray for your touch. Lord, we've been touched in so many ways this past week. Father, we, we really, really already miss Jess King. And, and it's just difficult right now. Mary Joyce and the rest of the family, they all need your help right now as they grieve. And we pray for your tender touch upon them, Father, as they are trying to deal with letting go of someone that they love dearly. But Father, according to your word, uh, you are present. God, you, you said in your word, Lord, that uh, it's, a, it's, it's a place, it's, it's a, a precious, precious in the sight of the Lord is the passing of one of your saints. And by saints, we mean those that know you as their Savior, those that have wanted to live for you uh, in, on this earth. And Father, we just pray for uh, you to help us to realize it was a precious time when he passed away. It didn't seem like a pleasant time as we were going through the grief. But Father, you know. And as we continue to grieve, help us, Father, help us to know he's in, he's in that place with you and enjoying uh, eternity. And Father, help us to be ready, all of us. And if we're not, I pray that you'd help those that are not ready, get ready to meet you. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Pray for your blessings upon the word that you'd bless it as it's given today in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you look at chapter 4, we're going to talk about growing up in the Spirit, growing up in Christ. And this is different than the, a message about being, you know, growing up, period. I'm talking about growing up, but I'm talking about maturity in Christ. There's a big difference. You can grow up and still not be mature. Have you noticed that? How many of you have seen adult children? Raise your hand. Oh yeah, all over the place we're seeing hands go up because we know that just because, just because you are, you have some years on you, doesn't mean that you are mature. There's a big, big difference. I realized when I got married that uh, thinking about Zach and, and the marriage yesterday, uh, I was talking to a couple of people uh, and, and I said, you know, I cried when I got married. Carlene walked, I saw Carlene walking up the aisle. And when I saw her walking up the aisle, two things happened to me. First of all, my knees began to knock. I never knew my knees to knock. They, they were, what, what, I mean, they were actually hitting each other, going like this. My knees were knocking. And as they were doing it, it's because all of a sudden, I began to see this beautiful lady walking up the aisle, the love of my life. And then I began to realize, oh my goodness, she's, she's putting her life in my hands. She's, she, she is wanting to go, to go with me through life's journey. And I'm thinking, I don't even have a job lined up yet in a while. I'm graduating from college, and and I and I'm thinking this is a great responsibility, and and so I thought, how can she love me enough to want to be with me, to marry me, and we have no assurance of the future? I'll tell you why, because she knew my heart. I knew her heart. We knew a God that we loved that had brought us together and brought our love together. So we had faith to believe that God was going to see us through, that he would be in our future as well as in our present because he had already been in our past. Makes sense, doesn't it? However, that still didn't keep me from humanly being afraid. I knew who the answer was and where it lay, but I still within me as a human being, as a man, who all of a sudden acquired a responsibility I had never known. My knees were shot, were, were knocking, literally knocking. They'd never done that before or since. And then as she walked up the aisle, took my hand, we got racing dogs. She wanted to know, I 
can't remember whether she said it audibly at that moment or afterwards, but she said, why are you crying? <laughs> Do you remember, Carlene, was it at the moment or was it afterwards? Okay. Why were you, she said later, why were you crying? Did you, were you upset that we were marrying? What was it? I said, no. I was overjoyed we were marrying. It's just that I just thought in my, in my own mind and heart, I was overwhelmed. It was tears of joy, tears of un uncertainty, because I didn't know how I, I would handle this responsibility, and I wanted to do it right for the one I love the most in this world. And so it was a kind of a mixed emotions, but it, it definitely, they were definitely tears of joy along with a lot of other things because I, I just wanted to do it right. So I say that to say that, you know what, sometimes we just don't know in our humanly, humanly speaking, we may feel like we can't do it right as far as living for the Lord and, do it and being mature enough to know how to handle life's everyday things and the crisis moments of, of life as we journey through this life. By the way, the real definition of the crisis moment is not just the bad things that happen, but also the life-changing things that happen. A crisis moment can be good things, but things that change your life, like having children, you know, or uh, having a sickness uh, might be a, a, a sad thing or a bad thing that you have to deal with. Crisis moments can be good things, a new job, and also a new responsibility. Crisis moments when things change. And goodness knows, if you live long enough, things are going to change. And things can change for the good, what seems for the good, or and for the better, or sometimes can seemingly change for the worse. But I want to remind you of Romans 8.28. All things work together for good for those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So as we have loved the Lord, and as we love the Lord now by living the way he wants us to, to have his blessing and his protection, God does some amazing things, and he has already done some amazing things with us. He's helped us to deal with the past in a healthy and mature way. As we realize the past, he can take care of it. All things can work together for good. That means he can make something good out of a mess that we've already made. Out of a life that was uncertain at one time. That we had messed up by making bad decisions and doing the wrong things. Hurting other people. Hurting our job. Hurting our own physical person by not living the way God wanted us to. I've talked to a few of you. And I'm just wondering how you still are alive. I'm wondering how some of you made it through childhood and the teen years and into adulthood. I'm serious. Some of you, if I had to live and, and be around you when you were growing up, it would have scared me to death. I'd have thought, you know, when is this guy or the, when is this girl, when are they going to just make a decision or do the wrong thing and, and their life is going to end? I think I'd have probably been standing away from you in case lightning struck, you know, because, and, you know, and, and when I say this, as mild-mannered and as, and as easygoing as Terry Brandon is, he told me about some episodes when he was just maybe right out of his teen years, going to college, possibly, am I right? No? no? Even after that. Makes it even worse, Terry. You know, that <laughs> something about a motorbike and some pushing the envelope. So listen, am I right? Okay, so, and then you had to have some feelings about marriage like I did, I'm sure. You know, you get into that. By the way, it's real close in proximity that same year, right? And and uh, so on. But anyway, uh, I, I say this because, listen, God is good about cleaning up after us. He is. 
God can clean up after some of you messes. You know, he can take it and he can put it together and he can make something good out of it. I know a, a kid that was a, uh, in our youth group when Carlene and I were youth directors before I started pastoring. And uh, he was in our youth group and the kid somehow, after we had left and started pastoring, uh, he got into drinking. And he said to me, I, I talked with him. In fact, he came and spoke to uh, our church uh, that we were pastoring a while later. And he said, you know, Pastor Tony, I, I was so hooked on alcohol. He said, I would pull the blinds, sit in the dark, sit all by myself and drink. Because he knew that other people would judge him and other people would ridicule him because now it had become a way of life. Now it had become something that physically he could not live without because he had gotten himself addicted. And so he, it affected his job, his marriage, and everything. So then he came to a decision for the Lord. God cleaned him up. So Romans 8, 28 is actually something that we could apply to his life. God, it all worked out for good. He became a counselor for an addiction center and he began to be a wonderful young man that could help guide lives of people that had handed their lives over to addictions and now they needed help so isn't that wonderful we've seen people that have been used by god in wonderful ways i know another young man that that uh that were that was addicted to alcohol and and I knew him uh, as he was younger, I was younger. And he uh, was so addicted and such an alcoholic that one night he drove his car up on the railroad tracks and hoped that a train would come through and just smash him up and kill him. Yeah, he was that addicted. He was that messed up. However, I have to tell you, he made a decision that changed his life. And you got thing got him out of that addiction and into a way of life that was what it should be. I say these things to tell you, maybe you're hurting right now. Maybe you're struggling. And it could be addictions. It could be, uh, and there are different types of addictions. There's sexual addi addiction, where you think that you can't have a positive relationship with the female sex or the, or the male sex because you are gender, because you feel like you just, you're, you're addicted. And, and you have a hard time seeing a relationship for what it should be as a man and wife, as something healthy, as a family. You may, you may have gotten messed up. Could be because of the family you were raised in. It could, could be because of the people you have used to you hang with and you've learned some bad habits. We do learn some bad habits as we grow up. And we all do. We Invariably, there are those of us that, that have seen other people around us and are following examples that are not healthy, that are not good. And we take those examples many times and apply those to our lives and think this, that we can get away with something because they did. Not knowing what it was doing and what it has done to those people that thought that it wouldn't have a bad effect on them in some way. Where they didn't look to the future and see what this would do to them in the long run. So God's Word, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. He can make something good out of the mess. He can take our life and channel it in ways with our gifts and talents that God has given us to forgive us and to set us on the right track and to get us to where we, we can actually begin to, to move through life in a positive way. Now, when I say we can move through life, we'll get to this in a minute. When I say we can move through life in a positive way, there's more at stake than just our own immediate life. What is at stake? What's at stake is, is that we have the children that we have raised, the grandchildren that, and they're still watching us, the children, and the grandchildren that watch our daily lives. 
those people that we work around that watch to see what means most to us. Is it God or is it an addiction or is it a habit? Is it a pattern of life that's not healthy? See, people are watching because, and I used to think they wanted to watch when I was a new Christian because they wanted to judge me to see how much of a Christian I was. That was not necessarily true, no. What they were watching for, I found in many cases because they wanted to know how I could be happy at work. How I, couldn't, how I could not be a complainer like other people. How I could know that God had a future for me and I was assured and positive that God had a purpose and a plan for me and everything would be okay. And that brings me to the other part of Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good for them that love God. Are you loving God with your life. Now Jesus said, I know you know you love me if you keep my commandments. See, the commandments are there. There's a way and a lifestyle that God's word tells us from his word what our lives should be like and what should be a part of our lives and how our lives should be have should have a purpose. And so Jesus was saying, I, I know you, you love me if you keep my commandments. In other words, if you are giving your direction and life and decisions to God, He could cause you to love the Lord the way you're supposed to. And when you love the Lord the way you're supposed to, you want to do the right thing. You want to give your future and your present and your past that you've messed up to, to God to change and to fix and to mold it into something that God can use. And you want your present and your future to be in God's hands also. Like David said, I would rather be in the hands of the living God than in the, ha in the hands of man. Me too. I would rather be in the hands of the living God than in the hands of men. Rachel, or Cadence, you need to wake up. Wake up, sit up right now, okay? Please. I know, I know. Uh, but still, this is the church, God's house, and I love you. And anyway, when we think about this, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good for them that love God, those that love God, and are called according to His purpose. Now let's listen to that. We have a call, when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, He changes our heart. He gives, God's Word says, He, he gives us a new heart, a heart that's different. He creates in us a new heart. That means it used to be a heart that was formed by the things around us, by the people we would have been hanging with, the people that we were raised with in a family, and all these things had affected our heart. But when we come to know Jesus Christ, we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior by asking forgiveness for our sins and asking Him to come into our heart, all of a sudden there's a newness that God has changed our heart and now we want to do things for God. We want to do the right things. We can't live the way we used to. Our, as my dad used to say, our want to's change. We don't want to do the things we used to do. Want to. I want to do the right things now. So all things are uh, work together for good for them that love God and are called. See the called. We are called. Now God brings a call into our life. Every one of us and you, some people say, well, if he didn't call me or I didn't read the Bible, I don't know that. Let me tell you what God's Word says. No, there, man, there is no excuse for man. One day we will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, I'm the one, according to God's Word, in the book of Romans, chapter 1, it talks about how God is a creator. He's made the trees. He's made creation. He's made all these things. And he says, and you can even see the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, through the things that he's made. So you know that God is real. You know the Creator. One day we will stand before Almighty God, before Jesus, and we will give an account of whether we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior or not. There is no man that has an excuse, God's Word says. O oh man, thou art not excusable is what Romans chapter 1 says. None of us, by the way, I mean includes women too, or girls. None of us have an excuse when we stand before the Lord and say, well, I didn't know. 
I knew I was on earth for some reason. I knew, you know, I, 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 yeah, I looked around, I, I thought that God was a creator. No, God is a creator, and you know it, and I don't care what you're telling yourself in your mind and heart, you know God is real. And let me tell you, when men are in the military and they're in a foxhole, they're praying. People say they can be atheists, but let me tell you, when they are under a crisis moment, moment guess who they pray to? God. They turn to God. We have to know that we need God. I remember taking my first jump out of an airplane in, in, as a paratrooper in training. And I, and I had a guidepost in one pocket, my New Testament in the other pocket. I had been reading them. And I said, God. And, and then the verse came to my mind, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And I thought, what am I doing jumping out of a plane? Am I tempting God? Am I, am I putting my hands in some other faith other than God? Am I letting these jump masters in this situation in the military take me and place me in harm's way? Am I wrong for doing this? And I said, you know what, God, it is what it is. I'm in the military. I'm doing this. Lord, just keep me safe. Help me have a good landing. Help everything work. And pray. And I pray, Lord, that I wouldn't break anything. You know. That, I mean, I'm serious. Jumped out the door praying. And yes, God has taken care of me. In the military, everywhere I've been, God has taken care of me. You know, and that's the thing about God. It, it's, God is not geographically limited with what he does for us. He can be with us anywhere we are, at work, at home, in the family, life, or and He can be just wherever we are. And, and so many times I've prayed for trips before we take them, Lord. Keep us safe when we take our vacation trip. Keep us safe when we're going to such and such a place. Just keep us safe, Lord. Bring us back home safely. And I've done that so many times. I even do it with my kids. Wait a minute. You're not taking off yet. We've got to pray first for your trip. I do it. Because, listen, we need to help our, especially our family too, to recognize God is the one that protects us. So I was going to say that as we, you and I, understand that he, we begin to realize that He can work out the past and straighten it out. He can work out the present and help that to be what it needs to be. All things work together for good. By all things, that means the past, the present, and the future. All things work together for good for them that love God. And so our actions should be the actions that are inviting God into our decision making and our life. That love God and are called. And he's got that call to salvation on every one of us. And if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you say, well, God's not calling you, you're lying. Because God's been call talking to you and calling you and helping you to know he's real all your life. And it gets uncomfortable sometimes when we realize that God has been working on us spiritually. And he has been calling us to make a decision. And when we haven't done it yet, life can get pretty uncomfortable. And what you need to do, if God's been working on you and you felt the call, what is that call? It's in your heart when you begin to understand and know, wow, I know I need to make a decision. I know God is calling me to salvation. And even when you're saved, he, he may be calling you to get some things straightened out. You know you need to go and ask forgiveness and get things straightened out. Maybe rededicate your life and get that start again that you need to have because you've been messing up. Even as a Christian, sometimes we make the wrong decisions. And then our life gets on the, another track that it shouldn't be on. I remember there was a man who used to work for the railroad. And he had had several jobs. But this railroad, he really enjoyed it. That was a wonderful job that he had. And, and, uh, and he was married. And, and he was in bad health now. And, and his wife was a good, faithful member of our church that I was pastoring at the time. Now, he was sick enough that, that he had uh, something going on. I think it might have been... You know, well, it was a debilitating disease of, of some sort. And so he could, I, I definitely COPD because he couldn't breathe and whatever else was going along with that. But I'd go to visit, her name was Mary, and, and I believe it was Jay. And I'd go to see them, and he would kind of disappear. 
He had talked to me for a few minutes, and I looked around, we're ready to go. And she'd say, well, you know, he, he can only handle so much, you know, his breathing and all that. But also, he gets to feeling a little bit convicted that he knows he's not quite right, and he'll just disappear. So I noticed something as I would come to visit, he'd start staying out a little bit longer, a little bit longer when I come to visit. Kept staying out a little bit longer. And then he got to the point where he couldn't really get out of his room. He was in his man cave, as his wife called it. And I'd have to go into his man cave to visit him. And when I'd go in there, he'd be in the bed. And, uh, and I'd say, uh, would you like me to pray for you? Yes, 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 please do. I said, well, you know, are you ready to, you know, make a decision for the Lord? No, 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 not yet, you know. So I'd get a lot of that. And then one day I came in there and he was watching him gospel program. In fact, the next few times I went, he was watching gospel programs. and But he wasn't ready yet, you know. But I asked his wife, I said, so what's going on that he's kind of watching gospel programs? She said, I think he's really thinking about the Lord now. I think God's speaking to him. The call! He was feeling it. He had felt it before, but he's not done anything about it. One day I came in, he said, Pastor, I just want you to know, and thinking back the way he thought and about what his life was like, he said, I just want you to know, Pastor, I got my ticket to heaven. I got my ticket to heaven for that train to heaven. I got it. I know where I'm going. He put it in words of things that he understood and knew about and had lived. And without a ticket, without God, to make it possible for you through Jesus Christ. You are not going to be on your way to heaven. So if you haven't done it the way Jesus Christ told you. If you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your savior. And you've recognized that he gave his blood and his body. Died on the cross for you. And rose again victorious over death, hell and the grave. So you don't have to experience those things. You will experience death. But you'll fall asleep in the Lord. Talks about going into eternity in a peaceful way instead of like some people do in a violent, awful way that don't know the Lord, you see. So as we look at this, we know that God's Word says some things that will help us to Christian maturity. And here it is. He begins, begins to talk about uh, He gave, uh, it says that He ascended, verse 10 of chapter 4, he that ascended is the same also, descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. We're talking about Jesus Christ. He came to earth as a baby in a manger uh, to, to uh, Mary, born un, uh, by Mary, uh, and God the Father, his Father. And so here he was, the Son of God, and uh, Jesus Christ, the God in the flesh, which Emmanuel means God among us. And so here he was, he... He ascended up to heaven uh, on the right hand of the Father, but he had first descended in the form of a man so that he could die for you and I on the cross. And it says here, um, so he that descended is the same that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Let's stop right there for just a moment. Here's what we see. Here, God is telling us in his word, that he's given some people specific jobs to do in the kingdom of God. Some he, he's called to be apostles. We know we've got those. And then uh, of work of the ministry, then the edifying of the body of Christ. For the edifying. In other words, what we are doing as we accept God's work for us is going to lift up the body of Christ, the kingdom of God upon this earth. It's going to lift up the church until we all come in the unity of the faith. So he'll bring unity in the faith so you and I can see growth in the church, growth in the kingdom, and we can see what God is doing in the lives of people. He brings the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. When he brings that knowledge of the Son of God, he begins to perfect us 
unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So when we begin to get knowledge of God, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, we begin to grow into the perfect man that God wants us to be. Until that time, we may be pretty immature. We may think that we can do things our way and that, uh, that our gifts and our giftings is something that we have and that we, it's, it's, we've got the abilities because we have studied to do it. We have practiced and all this stuff. And what we end up doing if we don't recognize the Son of God in our life we can use our talents that we have, the giftings, but we may use them the wrong way. So I want to share with you, if we are not accepting and learning about the knowledge of the Son of God, we can actually have the wrong purpose in life. So that's the last part of Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good for them that love God and are called according to His purpose. The first part of that call is the salvation. The rest of that call is our giftings that we have, that we can do things for God that He wants us to do. I saw James here and Katie, I saw them accept Jesus Christ in their lives. Yes, they had made professions. However, I saw them put God first and it changed their lives, their marriage, their ideas about life altogether. And when I called on James to lead in prayer and a service, and he said, yeah, I'll do that. About fell over, but I, you know what I realized? God is growing this family. He does that. He wants to do that. And he brings unity in you and I in the family of God and in our own personal families as we get the knowledge of the Son of God. So if you want to grow in your spiritual life, begin to get knowledge of the Son of God and you'll begin to see how God wants to live in your life. And He wants to direct your life. And it says, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of God. In other words, God wants you to have the measure of the fullness of Christ. That means He don't want you to go around with a half-packed bag on this trip of life, he wants you to go around with the full bag of whatever you need with the giftings and, and the abilities and the love of God through Jesus Christ that you need on this journey called life. Isn't that exciting? You're not going to. Do you ever go on a trip and you begin to think, did I turn the coffee pot off? Did I lock the doors? Did I make sure the, the pets have all the food they need, you know? Sometimes they go for a week, you have to put them in the, in the kennel, you know, to pay a bill for that. But, but if you're, you've got to make sure that you, and, and you, you might may be going on that trip and wondering whether, have you got all that you need? Did I pack such and such for when we do this and on our trip and all that stuff? You go through it. But listen, on this journey called life, when we learn more about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, He wants to make us a perfect man or woman unto the measure. In other words, not perfect humanly because we'll never be perfect till we get to heaven. But He wants to make us, He wants to perf perfect us. It's a work in progress. He wants to perfect us unto a measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, what He wants to bring us to is the stature of what Christ wants us to be. He wants to bring us to the place that Christ has for us. The fullness that Christ has in mind when, it, when he talks about that purpose that Christ has for us. And I have to know, tell you, again, I know some of you. I know some of you, some of you that are live streaming with me. I know some of you that have been in this thing called the Christian life for a while, whether you're live stream or in person. But I, I've often wondered, wow, you know, how can God do anything with this person? I, I, I knew their life. I knew what they were like. And all of a sudden, I see things start working out together and how God is changing them. I'm thinking, wow, isn't God amazing what he can do with us? Isn't it amazing how he can change people and how he can make us something, you know, create in us that clean heart and the want-tos do change. 
And then we begin to see there's a fullness of Christ that we need. And we want to accept that fullness of Christ. We want to go through life with that full bag of what God wants us to have. So we have the resource of Jesus Christ himself to help us with whatever we're going through. We've got the Holy Spirit. We've got God the Father, the Creator. And we have Jesus Christ who understands what we, what we are going through. Because he went through all things. He was tempted in all ways like as we are is what God's word says. So here he wants us to have that, that uh, measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He wants us to have the fullness of what Christ wants to give us, which is everything we need to make life's journey. Now look at verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cutting craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to the sea. Now what that's saying is, he doesn't want us to be like we used to be and like some people are right now that are children in, as far as their maturity goes in Christ. I'm talking about Christians right here. Or maybe those that are lost that have been bothered by Satan that have not received the Lord as their Savior. The first, the first part of the call is accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. And some people right now are children in their thinking and in their heart. They, they're, they're tossed to and fro. They're just buffed, buffeted back and forth by the people around them that get them confused and, and make them not understand God's word and, and make them think that there's a purpose in life that's other than what Jesus Christ wants for us. And then we don't see the fullness of life that we should see. They're, they're tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. That means there's all kinds of stupid things out there about God's Word, about God, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit. And Satan makes sure that he tries to confuse people to not understand God's Word if he can. And he'll try to do what he can to confuse families and kids that are growing up and adults that need to make good decisions for the Lord that may even be saved, but they're tossed by discrepancies and, and, the, and theology that's not right and doctrines that are not right that man has made and that we have let get in our way. And it says, now let's, let's look at the character of some of these people that Satan uses. They're carried about with every wind of doctrine. That means this we're to tossed to and fro. These immature Christians and some people that may not be saved because Satan is tossing them to and fro, carrying them, their thoughts and their hearts away with the wrong kinds of things. We're talking about the winds of doctrine. Doctrine that's not what God wants it to be. And it's out there in gossip and it's out there in false teachings and everything. And if you don't believe it, just think. We know that B.C. and A.D., has always stood for A.D., the year of the Lord. And that means the year he was born, a lot of time goes forward and is known by that. You know, 100 A.D., 100 years after Christ was born, 200 A.D., and all that. And then B.C., before Christ. Now they've changed it to B.C.E. and C.E., the common era, and B.C.E., before the common era. What does common mean? Get me out, though! You know what it means? Anything other than to have anything to do with Jesus Christ. They took Jesus right out of the time scale that we've used for thousands of years. You think that's an accident? I don't think so. I think Satan is at work again. And he's trying to do what he can to cause people not to look at the birth of Jesus Christ. And that time was separated by what he did for us when he was born. It was a fulfillment of prophecy. And it was when God was getting to, ready to do a wonderful thing on the cross and through the resurrection through Jesus Christ. And now they've tried to cause men not to look back on this marvelous event and recognize it as a time when Jesus changed time. When he, he, he divided time to before he came and to after he came. And mankind divided time because it was such a momentous event. Now what else does Satan use? He uses false doctrines, false theologies, of the slight of men. He, in other words, what does it mean by the slight of men? Sneaky men. He'll use sneaky people to get you all mixed up. Sneaky people. The slight of men. That means they'll, they'll do it 
and they will be so sneaky that they will pull things over on you and anybody else that will listen to keep the lost from being saved and to keep the saved from going forward in their life and fulfilling God's purpose. And they stay, and the Christians stay immature because they're listening to some of this stuff by the slight of men. And what else does Satan use? Cunning craftiness. Some of these people can be so cunning and crafty about how they, it says here, whereby they, how they lie and wait to deceive. That means they're so cunning and they're so crafty and the slight of men is so dangerous that they'll lie and wait to deceive you if you're a Christian. Satan wants to slow you down if you're a Christian. He wants to mess you up. He wants to make you stumble. He knows how to push your buttons. And many times it's the same buttons he was pushing that kept us from getting saved when we, when we got through that, keeping us from coming to the Lord when we should have. And when we do, he will use some of those same things. So be careful. Sometimes it will be other things that we don't, uh, that are not aware of. The slide of men. Cunning craftiness. Whereby they lie in wait to deceive. That means Satan will set up traps. He will set up an ambush. He will do what he needs to do. If it takes steps to do it, he'll do it. But he will do what he can to make you, make you fall. Make you fall. Make you fall further. Make you fall further. And one man, Jim Reeves, was used to be a famous uh, country gospel, or country singer, and he'd sing some gospel too. And you know, the thing is, he sung this song, the first step down, it goes kind of like this. The first step down is the longest. They get shorter the rest of the way. What does that mean? That means the first step you take toward the wrong thing, it's easier, easier, easier as you keep, as you make that first step. So if you don't want to smoke pot, don't smoke it the first time. If you don't want to do drugs, don't do it the first time. Don't want to take meth, don't take it the first time. See what I'm saying? Coke, heroin, all that stuff, just don't do it. And you know that thing they teach in school? The D.A.R.E. program? Just say no. Just keep on saying no to the wrong things, right? Keep on saying no to these people. Now listen, Satan has his people to mess you up. He has people around to try to steal you away from God's purpose by slowing you down, by making you stumble. He can't have your soul if you're saved, but he can sure mess your life up if you let him. But then again, if you're living righteously before God and, and listening to God's purpose and following his plan and going down his railroad track, as Jay would have said, <laughs> And you know you've already got your ticket. But let me tell you what he'll do. He'll throw some things in the way. If he can. And make your trip something that's not very smooth. He wants to do it. Satan wants to do that. And he wants to use cunning craftiness. And he will lie and wait to deceive. That means it may be something that's going to take steps. To bring you down to that level that he messes you up. It may take steps. It may be a series of decisions that you make that might be bad. Now, when we, when we look at what's going on, let me read a little bit of this. But speaking the truth in love may grow up uh, into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. From whom the whole body, verse 16, fitly joined together, uncompacted uh, by that which every joint supplieth, according to effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So God's word says, as you and I, God's people, will begin to speak the truth in love. We can begin to grow up. If we, have, well, if we know the truth, begin to learn about the Son of God to, to the, so He can perfect us, so He can begin work on us and, and make us perfect. Now, I'm not saying we're ever going to be perfect on this earth, but he want, it's, a, it's a work in progress. Perfect us, perfecting uh, unto the measure of what God expects us and wants us to be. A fullness that He gives us. And by the way, when you begin to live God's life the way He wants you to, 
It makes you have a fullness, of a completeness, knowing that God is at work. Speaking the truth in love. He causes us to be, begin to be able to know the truth in our hearts. And as we read it, it begins to stick out. To, oh my goodness, look at this, it's speaking right to me. And you begin to know, oh, wow, this is the truth of God. He loved me so much, he's showing me exactly what I need right now. And he's showing me how to make plans for the future. He gives me the truth. In love, and he helps me to speak that truth in love to other people that need to hear it so that they can get on the right tracks in their lives and begin to have. And what happens when we get on the right track and begin to do things the way that God wants us to? He puts his blessing upon us, his blessing, his favor, his love is upon us. And not only that, he hedges us about, like Job said, with his protection of love so that Satan. Can't touch us. If you don't believe that, you read Job and see. Yes. Look at this. Speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So if you want to grow up, just begin to learn more about the Son of God. That means you might have to read your Bible a little bit. It might mean that you might need to listen to the sermons a little. Go to the Bible study on Wednesday nights. And begin to hear things and know things that cause you and I to grow up. And notice, look, I like the way it says this. May grow up into him in all things. That means he's going to round us out. He's going to make us know a little bit about everything we need to know about how to handle women. We'll never know all the answers but on that one. But however, he'll help us to understand our wives better and how to speak to them, how to communicate, how to enjoy each other and how to enjoy life as we move through the journey together. He'll help us to know how we can understand our employer better so that we can do things the way God wants us to. You know how many times as a machine operator, I prayed about the machine. Lord, give me the wisdom to understand and to know what in the world is going on with this thing. Help me to know what they did in the other shift so that I can understand what needs to be fixed. Or when, when it's breaking down, troubleshooting, Lord, help me to know how to... You see, at work, Lord, help, help me to have the blessing that you give me to help me to know how to speak to people at work so that I can speak to them in such a way that it will be something that is not offensive but yet helpful to whatever I'm doing and whomever I'm talking to. Oh, yeah, I've done a lot of praying in the workplace, and we need to, because God can be with us geographically wherever we are, in the military, in the workplace, at home, in our relationships, He can be there. Now let's look at this, speaking the truth in love, we can grow up, if we'll listen to that truth that He gives us, we can begin to speak it too, and it's going to be a sign of maturity and growth that God gives us, and unto all, to grow up unto, uh, unto Him or into Him, in all things, that means He wants to make us well-rounded. That means He wants all areas and facets of our lives to be something that He can use. Causing us to have evidence of God in our lives, no matter who's looking and whatever the situation might be and no matter where we are. All things. And He is the head, even Christ. He wants to be our leader. He wants to lead us the right way. And listen, if you're like I am, I know I need help. And you do too. Left to ourselves, we can make a really good mess of just about anything. Would you agree? We really can. If you, don't, if you say no, I'm going to tell you a few things that I've seen. You know, we can have a good talk about it afterwards. We all need Christ to lead us as the head. And here we go. He doesn't want us to be, henceforth, be no more children tossed and fro. He don't want us to be tossed to and fro like we have no guide, like we have no head, like we have no idea what we need to be doing. He wants us to know the truth in love that we can grow up and be able to speak that truth in our lives. You notice that teachers that can speak the truth, that they can speak what they're teaching, those that know how to put it in words that other people can understand are probably the teachers that know it. Those that speak it so far over our heads that we can't understand it are many times people that don't have the simple understanding that they need to have to make it clear. If they've got such a confused, over 
over our heads of understanding of things, you kind of have to wonder how well they really know things. If you can't explain it to other people, I have to ask, do you really know your stuff? Right? Now let's look at this. He wants to bring the whole body together. And it says here, maketh, and he makes it an increase of the body. He will increase the body. He'll increase the church. He'll increase the family of God unto edifying of itself in love. He will lift up or edify, uh, encourage uh, the body of Christ in love. Now let's move a little bit down. Uh, it says, we, and some people have begun, uh, begin to be, they have understandings that's darkened, verse, uh, verse 18. They're alienated from the life of God uh, through ignorance that is in them. In other words, they don't know what they need to know to grow up. Their understanding is dark. They don't know. And they're blind uh, in their hearts, verse 18. Then verse 19, who being past feeling, I mean, they have been so seared by doing things wrong over and over that they're past feeling any conviction when they do it. Uh, have themselves given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greed. There's some people that have been doing wrong so much that they're past having a conscience about it. Their conscience, as God's word says, is seared. It's like somebody that burns himself over and over and over. Pretty soon you don't have any feeling in it. That's what God's word is saying. They don't even know. They don't even have any feeling anymore because they are seared. They're past feeling. They've given themselves over to lasciviousness. Lasciviousness is sinfulness, sinful living, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. In other words, if you know Jesus Christ your Savior, you know that's not the way to live. Now, if you see people around you that say they know Jesus Christ as their, their Savior, and they're, they're acting like that, and their, their understanding is dark, and they're alienated from the life of God, and they're, they're ignorant of what God says He wants them to do and how to live, and they're blind in their hearts, you have to wonder, first of all, do they really know Jesus Christ as their Savior? Just because they said they made a profession doesn't mean they're really saved. Make sure you know the Lord. And if you know the Lord is your Savior, and you've given yourself over to things that are not godly like that, brother, you either need to get saved, or you need to get to the altar and ask forgiveness and rededicate your life. Because it should not be. We can't be living in sin if we know Jesus Christ is our Savior. Now I'll tell you what, that's one of the reasons why people aren't around anymore. When they become a bad witness and they, they aren't doing the right things. You know, you know, God's word says if you don't obey your uh, mother and father, your father and mother in the Lord, then your days may be shortened. And we're talking about the example back when that was written from God's word. It was talking about the truths that God had laid down that, that your mother and father would teach you. The oracles, the word, the way that you and I should know how to follow the Lord is what we're talking about, the godly family. If you can't do that and you're not doing that, you better check your salvation. Carlene and I knew a lady that, that, that she knew and, and, uh, and she had uh, she just had the kinkiest, curliest hair. Kinkiest, curliest hair. And, uh, and, I, and it was just hereditary, I guess, but anyway. And she goes to the beauty shop and somebody told her that one of the beauticians told her, girl, you better check your bloodline. Right? Because she had the kinky, curly hair, and she probably didn't know that what her, her what her ancestry was. And if you know, it's just like if you don't know your the sicknesses that have run in your family, you might not need you might not know what to do with your with your body and the sicknesses that have come your way from uh, your uh, ancestry. And if you don't know what your hair has been like in, in your family, you might not know how they treated it to make it manageable. Manageable. I remember, I think I told this, when I was a teenager, I had these glasses I wore, wire rims, and my hair would grow and it would hit the glasses and go up like a visor, just, just like that. I looked as ridiculous as could be, and but my hair would just follow whatever it was, the collar, the eye, eyeglasses, and pretty, and you know, here's what I wonder. Why didn't my sister tell me how ridiculous I looked? Why didn't somebody tell me? With the white socks shining out and blazing because my pants were a little bit too short. And I was wearing white socks with black or colored pants. 
you know, I'm thinking, somebody could have saved me from myself. Did you know Jesus can save you from yourself? Jesus can save you from ridiculously missing opportunities and growing like you can, should and being the adult with understanding that you should have. And here's, here's some pointers. I'm just going to mention these and we're going to close. Here's some things you can do to cause yourself to be more mature in a Christian way. Maturity in Christ. Put off, verse 22, concerning the former conversation, the old man. Put off the old man. And by conversation, listen, it does not just mean, it doesn't mean just things you say. Conversation right here means lifestyle. It's more than just the words you would speak. It means the lifestyle. Put off the concerning that former lifestyle of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And poor little Cadence got hit the other day by a pickup truck on the way to school. And she was okay. But I said, Cadence, you what's the, what, what hit you? She said, a, a truck. I said, well, there's all kinds of trucks. Finally got out of her, it was a pickup truck, which is better than a semi, right? Yeah? And then I said, well, who was, did you recognize the person? She said, how do you know, you know? Uh, yeah, she said, well, I, I didn't know who it was. She said, I do know one thing, he was old. I said, why? Because he had white hair. I said, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Cadence. Making, having white hair makes you automatically old. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. Now, but when we think about this, listen. You and I need help. Even walking to school, we need God's protection, don't we? Yeah, we need God's, God's help and the conversation we have, and whether it's going to school, being in school, working, doing, you know, earning a living, we need God's help. But listen, God says, if you will just put off the old lifestyle, that old man that used to be in your heart and life, if you'll just put that off, he was corrupt according to deceitful lust. In other words, he was thinking about humanly things that were not good, and you don't need that in your life. This is the pointer right here. That God's word gives us. Put off the old man and his ways. His lifestyle. And then verse 23 said. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Wow. How do we get renewed. In the spirit of our minds. Begin to listen to God. Begin to get sin out of our lives. Pray for forgiveness. And let God begin to show us. Things about God's word. As we read about Jesus Christ. In his word. Some of us need renewed in our minds and in our spirits, but we can't get renewed because we're being bombarded because, because of all kinds of stupid and evil stuff that's in our way. And if you don't think there's some evil things on TV, you get away from rawhide and, and uh, wagon train for a little bit, and you'll see some stupid stuff, you know. Perry Mason, we look Perry Mason, yeah, pretty good. But you know what? They had morals back then. They had ethics. The good guy did win. I'm just saying things have gotten really bad in the media. Don't go there. Put off that former conversation, the old ways. Be renewed in your spirit. And how can you be renewed if you've got things playing around you and things that are programs that are programs that the world has and they're bombarding your mind and your spirit. You know what I said about Lot? Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. And pretty soon, you know, when they had a decision to make about whose men, you know, Lot, the nephew, uh, whether he would have this direction or uh, Abraham would have that direction. And when Lot, Lot, he said, you just decide which way you want to go and I'll go the other way. And so Lot decided he would pitch toward Sodom because the grass was really green that direction. And he pitched it. First, the next thing you read, he was in Sodom, living in Sodom with his family, and he had a position as a gatekeeper, which was a very powerful position back then. And so then the next thing you read about it is that God's getting ready to destroy that place because of the sin in that place. And Abraham is praying for protection for Lot. And you know what it says about Lot? It says that. He was grieved every day, every day, by the sin that was around him. Grieved every day because of it. Listen, 
I don't know about you, but I choose not to live in the grief of the world bombarding me. Get rid of it. Get away from it. Change the channel. Change the music. Whatever it is, get away from the things that the old man would be a part of. Be renewed in the spirit. Let God clean things up around you. And then verse 24 says, And put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. In other words, God has a new man he wants to make of you in that perfecting that he wants to do. Put on that new man. Begin to put on the, the ways, and, and by put on, I mean make it a part of your life. The new things that God has shown you and wants to show you. And, and it says, and after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. He wants to make you holy. He wants to make you righteous. And by righteous, I don't mean that you're going to necessarily be perfect. But you're going to have the workings of God in your heart. And, you, and the perfection that God wants to do, He's going to be perfecting you. To see right from wrong. To begin to see what Satan is up to so you're not a part of it. And here's a, another thing that you want another tip. You know, so it says, put off the conversation of the ways of the old man and his deceitful love. Be renewed in the spirit. And then put on the new man, the new ways that God has for you and I. And then put away lying. Can, really? You mean Christians can lie? Absolutely they can lie. You and I, if we're not careful, can lie. And Satan will use that. Don't let him make a liar of you. Remember, putting away that lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. When I say that, I don't mean hurtful truth either. I mean gently and lovingly help people to see what the truth is. Don't hurt people on purpose. Or don't hurt them without knowing it. Just think about how, God, how do I say this? How, how should I help them? And he will give you words. And then the next tip that he gives us is, Be ye angry and sin not. Let, the, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. There you go. So you can get angry, but don't sin. You can be angry. And you can't help for it, but be angry. But be angry. But don't sin while you're being angry. You might have a reason to be angry. But you don't have to sin just because you're angry. At work, you might get upset with somebody. That doesn't mean you need to throw a hammer at them. Or a Melmac plate. Or something like that. You know, you don't have to respond in an ungodly way just because you are angry. You and I can respond the way God wants us to. Don't sin because we're angry. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. And listen, that leads us to know this. That means the sun go down. Let, let, don't let the day end without getting that wrath straightened out. If you're angry with somebody and you have wrath, in other words, you had an argument with your wife or your husband or your kids, you get that thing straightened out before you go to bed. If you don't, you're going to have a restless sleep and so will they. You may think it's not bothering you, but three or four arguments down the way, you'll know things are getting worse. Right? You've got to let God help you to get rid of the wrath. Rid of the wrath. And God's word is very clear. You get it taken care of before the end of the day. Don't let that thing build up because it will. And before you know it, you won't even know what it was that caused you to be mad at each other in the first place. I've done enough counseling to know that. Why are you too mad at it? Why don't you talk to one another? Why do you feel like you don't get along and you can't work it out? I don't know. I can't remember where it started at. You see what I mean? Before you know it, if you don't come to uh, terms with it before the day goes by and before it's over, you may end up starting just exactly what this next verse says. Verse 27, neither give place to the devil. There you go. By not getting things worked out in your life and taking responsibility to make sure things are taken care of before the sun goes down, if you can, that's what God's Word said, do it before the sun goes down. You get things straightened out with your wife or your husband or the kids or uh, the employer, whatever you need to do. Don't wait around on stuff. You need to get things done. And when you do it God's way, He can work it out. But it says here, if you don't, you're giving place to the devil. 
That means you're letting him get his foot in the door. That means you're letting him start to mess with you. And you don't want that. Now we're coming to a close. Oh, verse 30. Something we really need to look at. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. We're sealed unto the day of redemption. You and I that know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are sealed unto the day of redemption. What is the day of redemption? It's either the day you die or the day Jesus comes back. Like the man said, I got my ticket, one day I'll cash it in. I didn't used to know what it meant when, it's, when somebody would say, so-and-so bought the farm. I thought, well, that's probably good, isn't it? He bought the farm, he got it paid for it. No, that's not what we're talking about. He died and his insurance paid the farm off. That's what we're talking about. I thought, well, that's not a very good thing. The fact is this, you and I should not grieve the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed until the day of redemption. One day we will have that day of redemption. But until that time, if we are not living the way that God wants us to, we can grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do you want to make God sad? Do you really want God to be unhappy with the way you're living? Don't you hate it? Don't you really dislike it when your child does something knowingly when you know you told them not to do it? Right? Right? It makes you feel so bad. It makes you wonder, did I, didn't I teach him right? Didn't I train him right? It makes you feel bad. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We're sealed into the day of redemption. That, the salvation is not the question here. It's about are you hurting God by what you're doing? Coming to a close. So let's all stand. And James, we're coming to a close here. We're going to have a slight invitation. Leave it on if you will until I make this invitation. It won't be long. But let's go ahead and bow our heads for just a moment. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that you help each one of us reflect upon our lives. Help us, Father, to know whether we've turned everything over to you. Father, help us to see if we've given place to the devil and let him get the foot in the door and causing us to stumble and causing us to go off track. Father, help us to know that we are following the purpose that God wants us to follow. Help us, Lord. And help us to get things taken care of before the end of the day, if we can, Father. Maybe work's a little bit harder to find that time to do it and so on. But we know with family and with spouse, husband, wife, and children in the household, we can get some things worked out. Lord, help us do it. And help us to come to the perfecting that you want us to have. To carry the resources we have of you by letting our lives shine. By doing things your way. By knowing that because we're trying to live for you, we've got you as our greatest resource. Help us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, with your heads bowed, eyes closed, I wonder how many of you would say, I don't know the Lord is my Savior, but boy, I sure am thinking about it. How many of you could raise your hand and say that? I don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, but I've been thinking about it, and I just need prayer, Pastor Tony, because I just really, really want to make sure that eternity for eternity, that heaven is my home. Anybody want to raise your hand? Nobody's looking around. Now, could it be that some of you may say, well, I know that I'm not allowing God to perfect me like he wants to, and I know that I'm not following down his path like I should. Could you raise your hand and say, pray for me, Pastor Tony? I need prayer. Several hands. Several. Several. Another. Anybody else? And another. Anybody else? I know that I have not allowed the perfecting of my life the way God wants it to be. And I need prayer, Pastor Tony. I want to pray for you. Anybody else? Can I pray for you? Please let me. It's one of the greatest things we can do is pray for those around us, especially those that we love, those that we know. Anybody else want to raise your hand and say that? Okay, now, could it be that you're going through some physical things? Your hearts are heavy because you've got physical things in your way that, that are not good, and it's, it's, you're struggling with them. Can I see your hand if... If you need help and prayer about that, several this morning. Anybody else? Several this morning. Okay. And it could it be that financially you, you're struggling because you've got some things going on that you're not sure how to handle. I've got good news for you. God knows all about it. And he knows what the best ways are 
to get things taken care of. I go to the Lord for my finances. In fact, I'm going to the Lord for my finances right now because, you know, when you're sick for a while and you're in the hospital, it's not long before you've got some bills. You know what I'm talking about? Let's take them to the Lord, all right? Anybody else, maybe it's an unspoken request you've got that you can just say, well, Pastor Tony, I need prayer about an unspoken request. I'm not going to mention what it is. There's one. Anybody else? Unspoken. Several more. Thank you so much. Okay, let's bow for a moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Father, we just pray that you would help us, Lord, to know that we could just take these things to you. That as we struggle and as we try to handle them ourselves, it's, it's totally unnecessary to carry things around like a weight because we haven't given it to you. And by giving it to you, Lord, I don't necessarily mean that we pray and ask you to take care of them and we just forget all about it. But I say, Lord, what we need is giving it to you and asking, Lord, if there's anything you can show us to do about it, uh, Lord, help us to know what that is and help us to be busy to do what you've tell, told us to do about it. And I pray for that wisdom and knowledge that only you can give. You can make it right. You can make it happen. And Father, help us to wait upon your word to do what we need to do. We thank you, Father, for these that have raised their hand for help with the finances. Help, Lord, with physical ailments or well-being, Father. We pray you'd help in that way, too. Some are unspoken requests, Lord. We pray you'd answer them according to your goodness and mercy. And, Father, we just pray that there be relationships or work. Father, you take care of this, too. We know nothing is beyond you. Like you said, Lord, in all things you want to work. Help us, Lord, to remember we can be well-rounded with your protection. We can have your protection every place we go with everything we do. We can have your goodness and your love and your resources, your protection. Help us to do that, Lord. And to remember, we call upon you no matter what. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're coming to a close now. I'll be back here next to the water fountain. You can shake my hand and say hello to me if you want to. And, uh, and then, if you will, Carlene will come up. Listen, we've got uh, ties. Uh, Terry, if you would, uh, I don't know where the plates are right now. I think they're in the office in there. Uh, Terry's going to get one of the offering plates. And he'll be at the door there. And as you leave and you want to give your tithes and offerings, please be uh, sure to do that. Because the church still needs to uh, pay the bills and uh, take care of this beautiful building that God has given us. Aren't you happy? We've got a place to worship. So many churches have lost their buildings, lost their churches in this pandemic that we've had going on over two years now. Uh, music, Debbie Mills will be coming uh, during the, the expo that you have in Van Wert, uh, Jane, that you go to. Uh, she'll be coming. She said, Pastor Tony, I just want you to know, so many of the places I used to go to, the small churches, some of them that didn't have much, but I would go anyway. She said, some of them aren't there anymore. So many of them are not there. See what God has taken care of us. I appreciate that, don't you? I really do. All right, well, we're going to be dismissed. James, would you dismiss us in prayer? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, for blessing us with work today. Thank you for blessing us with the church and Pastor Tony. Please, Father, watch over, protect, and bless all the members of the congregation throughout the week. And thank you, Father, for everything. Thank you for sending your son. We'd like to ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, James. Remember, Wednesday night.